right, I think we're right at 10 o'clock, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, good morning. BEMA is very happy to bring you another webinar, this week featuring our baking industry producers that serve on BIF. Um, I'm Emily Bowers. I serve as the liaison for the forum, and I will be moderating the panel today. Throughout the town hall, you'll have the ability to type questions in the question and answer box that's provided by Zoom. We'll do our best to answer questions while on the call. Any that we do not answer during the webinar um, will be given to the panelists and we'll post those on our blog after, after the webinar. Um, when this session is complete, you'll receive a very short survey regarding your experience. We would love for you to take a few moments to give us your feedback so we can continue to bring you quality webinar content, answer the questions you're looking for. Um, additionally, our webinars are recorded and posted to our website a few days after the event. So if you missed the supplier town hall last week, it's available on our website now for viewing. Um, with that, we're gonna go ahead and get started today with introductions of our panelists and the topics of conversation. So panelists, please introduce yourself, uh, give us your name, your company, and the role you play in the bakery. And Mario, we'll, we'll start off with you, please. Hi, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Mario Somoza. I am president and CEO of Pan Pepin, and we are a commercial bakery focused on fresh bread buns and tortillas in Puerto Rico. Good morning, everyone. I'm Brandon Heiser, and I'm the Chief Operating Officer for Roscan Baking. Good morning, everyone. I'm John Malloy. I'm the Vice President of Operations at 151 Foods in New Jersey. We are a fresh bread bakery and also frozen supplier as well. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Richard Yavara. I'm the Industrial Maintenance Manager for Capital Projects at Public Supermarkets. Thank you. Our discussion today is going to have a few key topics. Um, we're going to talk about workforce issues, safety, general operations right now, um, capital expenditures, and some trends. Uh, we know that safety of the workforce is of utmost importance always and especially right now, considering the pandemic atmosphere. So let's cut right to the chase. What are you doing at your facilities to protect associates and reduce the possible spread of the illness? And Richard, could you start us off? Uh, yeah, we've, we've, we've taken some additional steps to um, ensure that we uh, are uh, you know, watching out for associates uh, and also the, the products that we uh, manufacture. We're, uh, you know, we're doing thermal scanning as folks enter the facility uh, to ensure that they're not uh, coming in with any type of, uh, you know, elevated temperatures um, that, that uh, might, you know, be a symptom from the virus. Um, internally to our operations, we've taken the additional step of everybody uh, wearing masks to ensure that uh, we're not spreading it through uh, any type of respiratory uh, issues uh, that somebody may be having um, because we do move a lot of air around in our facility just to maintain a 35 degree uh, zone. So uh, we just uh, just uh, take those extra precautions. Yeah, we're uh, we're doing a lot of the things that Richard mentioned uh, and, and dozens, you know, there's there's dozens of things we do uh, on a daily basis and there's there's things that come up uh, as guidance changes as, as things change. Um, the issue is, is very time consuming. Uh, it's, it seems like it consumes about 95% of our day uh, today versus the, the things that we used to be able to work on and, and, um, and, and resolve. But I tell you, the, there, there's a lot of uh, things that we're doing, but the, the biggest focus, I think, for all of us is the social distancing. Um, it's just, it's just, uh, it's, it's changing people's uh, norms of how they interact and, and how they go about their daily work. So that's probably the biggest, uh, the biggest thing we focus on uh, because it's, it's the, it's the major contributor to the spread. And, and we, uh, to aid in that, not only are we doing, not only are we doing training, but we've, we've had to install some, uh, you know, some temporary barriers like you see. In, uh, in, in different parts out in the public, uh, in stores and things like that, where, um, where we have people who are not able to maintain that six feet. Um, but, but it seems like um, uh, there, there's, there's uh, things that change every day and it's just continuing to 
preach the message to the people to, to maintain that social distancing. We've, we've taken uh, a lot of the same measures that uh, Richard was talking about uh, as far as the personal and the operation temperature taking, uh, providing them PPEs uh, to use. And we're also enforcing, like Brandon was saying, uh, social distancing and you know hand washing and all that other stuff. Uh, another component that we've had to deal with is because we have uh, about 150 root salesmen and merchandisers that go out to the retail stores to service. Uh, and most of that servicing happens during store operating hours. Uh, so we had, uh, during those first few weeks when it starts, all started going down, a lot of our salesmen coming back very concerned that they are very exposed to, uh, to all those people in, in the supermarkets and the grocery stores that are trying to reach the product, going around them, uh, and they're on top of them. So from day one, we provided them uh, gloves, masks, face shields, uh, hand sanitizer, disinfectant spray to use in their roots. We're sanitizing and disinfecting uh, the trucks more frequently, a, including the cockpit, which is not an area that we'd necessarily focused on before. And, and we've also given them the leeway to say, you know, if, if you need to uh, retire from the store because there's a rush of people coming in there at one particular point, uh, and you just need to go to the back while that kind of dies down, we've told them that that's fine. We even have some of them that kind of construct their own barriers using red rays so that people won't jam them while they're in the, on the aisle servicing. So uh, it, it's another component beyond the operation that we've had to take a look at and seriously uh, implement some measures there. Okay, thank you. And to just to add into what everybody else is doing, of course, we're doing the thermo uh, temperature checks, applying, uh, supplying masks, but we're also identifying the work area on the with floor locators. We find that that helps a lot with the social distancing and just trying to get people spread out across the plant and uh, and even have come up with some creative deflectors where some folks have to work across from each other um, and using, believe it or not, something as simple as a shower, a clear shower curtain, but at least it gives that person um, the security that the person that they're working with, at least there's a barrier between them. So. Sure. Sounds like you're getting creative and trying to keep your employees safe. Um, tell us about what you're doing in terms of compensation or other perks for employees that are continuing to come to work. Uh, yeah, I can, I can speak a little bit to that. Um, one of the things that uh, Publix has done is uh, we've, uh, we've pushed out a couple of raises to our associates that are supporting all of our manufacturing plants even all the way out to the stores. Um, they have gotten, uh, you know, 3%, 4%, 5% increases uh, over, the last, uh, over the last month. And there's another increase that's uh, going to be coming out within another, another month. Um, we've also um, worked uh, with some of our uh, associates that are actually being strained by the demand uh, to get the product out to our stores because they're just being inundated at this point. Um, to, to create a, a safer environment, um, we've uh, extended a, uh, the opportunity to some of our other folks that are working in, in the different facilities to come and support the distribution centers. And the incentive for that is we've uh, given them a $2 an hour increase on Saturday, Sundays to come in and support those efforts to get those products out to our stores. So we've, uh, you know, we've, we've done what we could to, to support those guys and show our appreciation of them taking the time away from their families to ensure that we're getting the, the product out to uh, all, of our, all of our customers and certain of the communities. Um, Roscam has implemented a, a, an increase in hourly wages of $2 per hour for every hour worked. Uh, another thing it's, um, is we've, we've relaxed our attendance policies, uh, people, need to stay home with their, um, with their kids. Uh, it's hard to find uh, child care, uh, or if they maybe have a, uh, a potentially high risk uh, individual in their home. So uh, we've, we've just had to be very lenient on, on, on attendance and, and things of that nature. Um, the, the, the challenge with the uh, increased pay is we want to be, you know, careful not to incentivize people to come to work sick, but also as uh, Richard mentioned, show appreciation for those that do come to work. We're doing also some uh, weekly uh, lump sum bonuses uh, to all those employees that are still coming in, uh, again, because they're, they're leaving home uh, in, the, in the midst of uh, all, the, all this that's going on. 
Uh, and we've also been able to give out some leave of absences to employees that may have somebody in their household or they themselves may be high risk uh, just because of uh, age or respiratory conditions or whatever. So we've had to work with them on that. And, um, and we've also certain days and we're doing one this week where we've uh, talked to one of our uh, restaurant customers. Of course, they're having a hard time also and they're just trying to, to get by. So we contracted them to put together 300 lunch boxes for our employees uh, so we can all give everybody here a lunchbox uh, on Friday. Maybe just a little bit detailed to help them, you know, feel a little bit better about the week. Thank you. So with your uh, changes to compensation and attendance, are you finding that you're able to maintain your workforce? Or are associates still leaving? Um, the, the, you know, usually when we talk about workforce, we talk about uh, the competitive labor market. And this, this pandemic is totally different. Uh, we do have people not coming to work or leaving work, but it's, it's, it's based out of fear. It's not because they're going and find another job. So uh, it's just a, a different challenge um, that, that we're dealing with. Uh, it's not, not as tangible as, as what we have faced in the past. So I would say um, it's not necessarily people leaving to go to other jobs. It's just um, making them feel as comfortable as possible uh, that we're doing everything we can do and should do to protect them while at work. We've had a lot of folks that um, they do want to work, but they're also very mindful of how serious the pandemic is and to make sure that they're safe working around all their other um, associates. So, In our case, you know, one it's of the similar to what, uh, sorry, very similar to what Brandon was saying. Uh, hasn't been so much a threat from people going to other industries so much as the uh, the individual circumstances that each one is facing at home uh, under fear maybe of contagion uh, that's sometimes keeping them away. You know that's one of the things that uh, you know Publix has also done is we've gone back and, and uh, kind of re relaxed on a lot of our absentee policies uh, which would allow them to uh, you know, to take time off without any type of consequences um, if they are if they're feeling ill um, in regards to sick time, which is generally need, needed to be supported by a note from your doctors. Those have been relieved, um, but uh, you know, there's there's just a lot of things that we're we're doing out there to make sure that uh, if somebody needs the time off, that they're able to take it off. Okay, so it sounds like you have your workforce um, moving right along. So I'm going to switch over to other people that might come to your facilities. So um, tell us about how your policies have changed for outside sales reps and suppliers and, and, and them coming to your plants. Under what circumstances are you allowing suppliers to come into the facilities? Um, we have changed our policy. Basically, nobody's allowed in except for our, our staff, um, unless it's an as needed basis. We've um, had a couple projects going on. We decided whether or not they were a have to, and if they weren't, then we basically put projects on hold for right now uh, until we can get through this. Yeah, very similar with us. Um, all the projects have been pretty much put on hold. Um, due to the demand of the manufacturing plants, uh, they're they're producing around the clock, seven days a week, uh, just trying to maintain the product flow out to our, our customers. Uh, so we've uh, you know we've kind of put those on the, on the back burner until uh, we can uh, find a more comfortable, more reasonable time to go ahead and and get those implemented. Uh, we we had projects that were already in motion. We've uh, fortunately have the space to store you know, millions of dollars worth of capital equipment until the installation window opens up for us. And that, uh, that will be determined on where we, where we end up with this pandemic and everything that's going on around it. Yeah, at Roscan, we obviously implemented the uh, 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 procedures that everyone has as far as visitors. And, and like everyone else, we're eliminating any, any visitors that are non-critical. Um, and, and it's really, we, we, people can come in and be safe, but it's really about eliminating disruptions because they're, they're, we, there's so much focus on, on this pandemic and, and keeping our employees safe that we really are just trying to limit the, the noise that we deal with every day. And the other thing that I thought was pretty interesting is 
that um, our employees, uh, when they, you know, obviously uh, in, in food facilities, we train our employees to recognize people that aren't supposed to be there, but they're curious about if even, even if uh, a person comes from one plant to another, why is that person in here? Uh, because it's a very serious issue. So it's, it's not only eliminating the disruptions, uh, but also uh, our employees are concerned about it. So we want to make them feel comfortable too. So the answer to the question is only very critical issues would we have them in our facility. So understanding that, um, how do you want them to proceed? Um, are phone calls and video conferencing the best solutions or do you have other ideas to suggest? Well, well I believe that the, the uh, I think I, I put it this way the other day is when we're forced into doing things differently, we tend to get a lot better at it. Um, we've, um, we have meetings every day, video calls and, and conference calls, and that's, that's very effective. But my personal opinion is it'll never replace face-to-face -face interaction, and that has to happen, especially when working through critical issues. Um, but, but also um, the way that uh, we've had to change and communicate and meet, we've also realized that uh, we, we had a lot of things that we were doing that weren't very efficient, wasting a lot of time uh, in meetings or, or things like that. So hopefully we can take those learnings going forward. You know, it's, uh, you know, pretty much the same with us. We, uh, you know, we've uh, started to push our technology out there and understand just exactly what we can do with it. But, and, you know, and that is being driven by the fact that we've uh, all but eliminated our travel. Um, to go visit some of our suppliers who are working on projects. Um, we've actually done several, uh, you know, conferences this morning on what we call teams, which allows us to collaborate with one another from different locations. But we've got some large projects. I've, I've got a 120 page uh, construction document that I need to go through with nine people. And uh, it, what we call it is a page turner. Uh, we go page by page by page and uh, you know we're able to do that with teams and everybody's able to go ahead and give us their input on it but you know that's that's the best way to keep our uh, our progress moving forward because once this uh, once we get past this uh, this pandemic um, our projects are going to need to go forward now some of these are essential fresh kitchens so on and so on but um, but yeah they're uh, you know, these, these are projects that, uh, that are still continuing to move forward, even though we are all isolated. So, you know, understanding our technology, where our weak points are, is, is obviously, you know, uh, unmask those. Um, so our IT folks are going crazy. Um, <laughs> so, but, uh, but no, it's, uh, it's really, uh, it, I find it to be challenging and uh, enjoyable to do, to do things remotely. So uh, for us, it's, uh, it, it, it's a benefit. In our case, uh, because of our location and we're not as accessible as Florida or New Jersey or Michigan, uh, we've generally always had to do uh, planning further ahead with our vendors for their visits and so on. And in the past, we've used FaceTime or Skype uh, to, for our vendors to deal with our maintenance or engineering personnel whenever a situation comes up. Um, so I, I think this will actually help us get better at that. I think to the extent that our vendors and suppliers uh, do get more used to maybe doing, you know, virtual service calls, uh, be it against Zoom or FaceTime or Skype or whatever. Uh, they'll become better at it. And I think that will benefit us in the long run where we may not need as many personal visits. Uh, and we may just be able to to take care of some issues in a, in a more, you know, quicker, faster manner uh, than we were used to before. And a lot of our suppliers have reached out to me and, and our production folks as well, just to make sure that everybody's in good shape, if there's any needs that we have. Um, people have been very personable about reaching out by email or by phone call. Um, even a couple uh, equipment suppliers, our maintenance team has been on Teams or on Zoom working through situations. So it's uh, everybody's kind of like pitching in and helping out the best that they can considering the situation. Okay. I You've addressed many uh, challenges that your teams have faced. So as the leaders, uh, tell us about how this pandemic situation has brought your team together and if you're seeing new, new leaders emerge. At Roscam, we sure have. It's, it's really brought our team together. Uh, the, I think uh, it, 
a team is has to come together when when there's really no true answer and we're all trying to figure this out together. Uh, one thing that um, is not so much fun is I've had to eat my own words probably more in the last three or four weeks than uh, in the last couple of years. And that's because things are changing every day and, and we can be so confident one day uh, that we're gonna address a certain issue a certain way or no, we're not gonna do this. And then something changes tomorrow and we have to totally backtrack and, and, uh, and change what we're doing. Um, it's also given the opportunity for people to step up uh, take, take on new challenges, take on uh, uh, areas the focus that normally they would not because there's just so much to do and so much to, to think about and work through. So we, we've seen uh, our, our different leaders um, rise up to the occasion in many different cases. You know, it's, uh, it's very similar to, to Brandon's case. We've had a lot of people um, come forward um, in different situations. Um, in our manufacturing plants, especially where we're trying to move a lot of different materials around, bake a lot of different products, change a lot of SKUs. Um, the, the, the individuals that do that on a day-to-day -day basis really follow a pattern. But what we found is because of this, uh, this new norm for us, that they've come up with pretty, uh, pretty good ideas on how to improve their processes um, and actually have become more efficient um, in, in putting those together and, and all you, have, you know, nobody had asked them in the past, but now they actually have a pretty, pretty good uh, impact to their operation, which is, uh, which is great. Um, it, it kind of, uh, you know, allows them to kind of voice the things that they have, uh, you know, that, that they haven't spoken on too much, but, um, and, and it's actually, like I said, been very beneficial for us. So, uh, we we see a lot of new leaders coming uh, coming out of this uh, this epidemic, and uh, and and that's that's great because um, you always want those individuals to to be in place as you have successorship or people move through the organization. Uh, that's uh, that's always a benefit for us. I I agree. In our case, uh, we uh, like uh, Brandon was saying. We, we, it's a, such a fluid situation. Everything changes by the day, if not by the hour. You're learning something new on how to manage or attack whatever new situation is coming up. Uh, so we've also had to backtrack a dozen times as far as, you know, we, we decided we weren't going to do something. And then next day we say, no, no, now we got to go uh, in this other direction. So we have seen people, again, at every level because we're all dealing with the same fears and anxieties. It doesn't matter who you are. Uh, but we have seen some of those leaders emerge, uh, be it a line operator, an engineering supervisor, sanitation manager, or somebody who are just, you know, better at managing uh, all the uncertainty and all uh, everything that's 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 thrown our way. Um, and even though they may not necessarily be in a uh, in a design leadership position, but just the, the, their attitude, the way they carry themselves, the way they communicate, uh, up or down. Uh, they're just setting an example for everybody else around them. Uh, and those are the people that, again, that we know that in a, in a crisis mode, we can definitely re rely on them to step up. I've always said how proud I am of the team here at 151 on how they always uh, step up to a challenge when we give it to them. Um, and they've, everybody's kind of just working mm -hmm. together. They know that they, nobody can do this on their own. It, uh, we're all have challenges and uh, we're getting through it every day. Um, <laughs> sometimes like children, I think we all know that. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, you know, they, they're really relying on each other and they, they take care of each other. So it's, it's been real collaborative for sure. Excellent. We're gonna dig in a little bit to um, the topic of operations. How has this whole situation changed your view on labor and automation? Uh, Emily at, at Roscam, I don't think it's really changed our view on automation. I think automation is still the way of the future. It's it's how we uh, uh, can can control our cost. Um, but um, one thing that we <laughs> that we have seen lately, we do have some very automated lines and some not so automated lines. And uh, as you automate, you obviously reduce positions, and then therefore absences hurt you even more. So. There's positives and negatives, but but overall, uh, I don't. My opinion is it hasn't changed our view on automation. 
Yeah, automation on from a Publix's perspective is, is a huge benefit to us. Um, some of the environments that um, we've, we're having our associates work in are, are, are pretty challenging. Um, working in a 35 degree room all day is, is a struggle. Um, so what we've done is, you know, we've got numerous projects out there. We probably install three or four robots a year for automated uh, material handling on our end. Uh, which which benefits us uh, in regards to ensuring that the product is is constantly flowing out. Um, but you know, like I said, it's uh, it's not so much as uh, eliminating the uh, the labor from it and the associate from it, but it's more trying to get them out of that environment. Mm -hmm. So we have we have numerous projects that are that are moving forward that are automated. Uh, and right now, they're just, uh, like I mentioned earlier, they're just kind of sitting on hold and, and waiting to, to move forward till we find a window where, where we can implement. So that's all good. Yeah, in, in our case, it doesn't really change our view on automation. I, I mean, we, we try to do as much as possible, uh, not only because of whatever ROI of automation versus manpower may be there, but you know, our experience with dealing with hurricanes and how you can't get all the people here, that tends to be our only limitation. So to the extent that we can, that we will need fewer people to run each line, then we like to look for that uh, and, and try to keep moving that way. So again, this, this the, what we're going through right now just kind of validates uh, that direction from us rather than really changing anything. And to Brandon's point, um, actually, having staff in the building right now is a positive with as many folks that um, are out for various different reasons right now. So um, we, we move a lot of people from line to line. Um, you also find right now with uh, the call outs and stuff that, um, you know, uh, you're picking what and choosing which line you can run from day to day. So, um, and with that being the main concern every day, really not looking to changing our process right now, looking to maintaining our processes and staying as efficient as we possibly can. Okay. We have a question about um, globalization. Um, some have heard mention that there could be a reluctance in relying on a foreign supply versus domestic. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Um, my opinion is that obviously what we're going through now is, is is just trying to find supply. And, and Roscoe doesn't have a, 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 a lot of issues. Um, and I think things will change in the short term, but I think long term, um, I think things will go back to normal and, it, and it's really about overall cost, but we haven't seen a big change on our end. Yeah, for us, um, we, we tend to look at our local um, suppliers and companies uh, that we, we try and do business with uh, on a daily basis. Uh, there are components that you do have to go overseas for. There's, there's just no doubt about it. But in regards to supporting our, our community and our suppliers that are, that are local here to the U.S., we certainly look at them uh, on, on a first, you know, uh, on, on a daily basis. Uh, you know, in, in many cases, our suppliers, um, for instance, we have, we have a situation now where. Uh, some of our suppliers, their their volumes, their, their products were basically looking to be spoiled uh, in the field and or in the, at the dairies. Uh, we've opted to go out and purchase those uh, supplies from them and bring them into our plants, uh, uh, produce them, you know, process them, uh, and then donate them back to the food banks uh, just to help them through this situation uh, to 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 ensure that their you know their livelihood is maintained. Net, net in the end, it, it helps everyone. Uh, we, we haven't seen anything in this experience that would really change our position. I mean, our, our suppliers have all come through uh, at this time, so we haven't had to, to go look outside of that. And, and just, you know, using ingredients as an example, uh, already with FDA and, and, and meeting SQF uh, regulations, there, there's, there's already so much tracking and tracing uh, being done on where we're sourcing ingredients. Uh, that I don't think there's really anything uh, new coming out of this that, that would, you know, limit us from saying, well, we're not going to take ingredients from this country or that country just because of whatever experience they're going through. So no, no, no change, really. And we're not looking to make any changes. We're happy with the suppliers we have. We're happy with the support that we get. Um, 
hopefully this will be over soon enough <laughs> and we can all move on and continue to do business. So. so on the other side of this crisis, everyone keeps uh, using the phrase new normal. So what percentage of your normal schedule are you running right now is a question that's come in. And then second part of the question is, what will change? What will the new normal be for your businesses? You know, for, for us here at Publix, we're, um, you know, obviously our uh, manufacturing plants are running 24 hours around the clock, uh, you know, seven days a week, if at all possible, we'll go down for sanitation when we have to. And if we break, we minimize uh, the, the amount of time that, uh, you know, that we're, we're, we're down by, you know, making sure that we've got additional maintenance uh, folks on, on board. To, to support that, uh, that expedited, uh, you know, uh, fix. And then also, you know, some of the things that, um, that we've looked at there, as you stated, Emily, th this, is, this isn't gonna change a lot. Uh, it's a new norm is what it's gonna be for us. Um, controlling the products that are coming into our facilities uh, through various means of, of sanitation in order to not only protect the associate, but protect the product itself as it's in its raw form before it gets manufactured. Uh, we're, you know, we're, we're posing uh, different uh, procedures to, to watch it come in the door and when it exits to the door uh, to our distribution facilities, it's, it's, it's all new on how these, uh, how these products are handled, how they're being tracked. Um, and uh, so there's, there's, uh, there's a new norm for us, absolutely. I would um, say the big change, I'm sorry. I would say the big change for us right now that we're going to take from this is probably the temperature checks, the thermal mm -hmm. testing. We're looking into it now, and it looks like that it's going to be here to stay. So. Okay, you've had to make a lot of decisions, and you've spoke about those this morning. What resources are you using to guide your decision making right now? Emily, the the thing that I found that helps the best is a good bourbon. <laughs> no, it's just, there's, I, I, uh, seriously, there's a lot of sharing, uh, in the industry between, uh, manufacturers and customers and, and within manufacturers, uh, we've had to develop so many new policies and guidance and how we deal with certain things that we've never dealt with before. And I've never seen, um, that level of sharing. Uh, we've got, people sending quotes that normally wouldn't sing, you know, hey, we, we ordered this, this is what it cost. If you need it, here's where you get it. Uh, I tell you, it's, it's been, a, it's been a, a good experience for us to, to have uh, everybody sharing so much because we're all in this together and there's nothing, you know, how we deal with this pandemic is not a competitive advantage. It's, it's just, let's all get through it the best we can. It's certainly been a collaborative effort with a dozen of our friends in the, in the industry. Um, we talk a lot, we text a lot, and uh, we support each other. So it's been a real collaborative effort. Yeah, be, beyond um, like Brandon and John are saying, you know, we, we've definitely had uh, a lot of sharing going back and forth. Uh, and that's usually, you know, when, when something comes up, uh, it's usually the, the, the first uh, resource that at least I, you know, I, I reach out to. Uh, but other than that, of course, staying up to date on everything the CDC is putting out. Um, I think also ABA has been good about uh, sharing some, some of the resources from the Food and Beverage Industry Alliance uh, that I do refer to uh, quite frequently. So, uh, you know, it's, it's, it, I think, you know, there, there's been a lot of resources out there and, and like uh, John and Brandon are saying, people have not been uh, afraid to, uh, to share their knowledge and their experience. It's a bonus to working in the baking industry. Everyone shares. Um, have any of your plants had to completely shut down? And if so, what recommendations do you have for starting back up and going back to full capacity? Um, we, we had uh, to shut down one of the lines for two days. Um, we had one uh, positive, uh, positive on, on one of those lines. Um, thankfully, you know, we, we followed the, the protocol. We, you know, identified those people who were in close contact with them. Uh, not only we sent them home for, for a few days and then to get tested, we tested everybody on the line. 
Uh, thankfully, everybody came back negative. Uh, and that was actually over Easter weekend when, when we'd had the line shut down already for a couple of days. Uh, so once we, once we went through the whole sanitation dis disinfecting process in the line, we were ready to start up on Sunday. But again, with people, some people out for uh, quarantining and, and, you know, other people that, you know, were just nervous or afraid, didn't want to show up, we were short of personnel that day. So we actually were not able to operate that line for those two days, not out of the sign, but just because we didn't have enough people to run it uh, for those two days. Once we, after those two days, again, that uh, everybody was comfortable that, that all the work had been done, that there were no more positives uh, on that line. So that was an isolated incident, maybe somebody who was infected more at the community level or at home that it wasn't, uh, that, that there was a, you know, a higher than normal risk of infection in the company then the people came back. So again, we followed the protocols and, and, and our team responded great, the whole sanitation team, the operations team. And even though we didn't operate that line for a couple of days, we were able to operate everything else. Uh, so it was really minor impact on our operation. You know, um, here at Publix, we've been, we've been pretty fortunate. You know, we, we have 198,000 employees that are throughout our, our retail business units, our manufacturing plants and different locations. And um, they, they've all been proactive in this, uh, during this time period. Um, everybody has stepped up to ensure that the different uh, you know, policies and procedures that were put in place are, are being followed. And, uh, you know, and, and that's really been helpful to us. Um, we are an ESOP company, so, you know, it, it, it helps them to ensure that our businesses stay up and operational. So uh, we're, we're pretty fortunate that we've got uh, those types of associates that uh, are very, you know, very uh, close to the, you know, close to Publix and uh, are, are loyal and, and just ensure that uh, we, we stay in production. Emily? Yeah. Uh, we, we haven't had any uh, major shutdowns. Um, we've had some, some, some issues where we've had to shut a, a line down for a shift or, or things like that. But what I wanted to comment on is one thing that's come to light uh, to me is uh, by nature, most of the things that we, we deal with and talk about in regards to startups and shutdowns and, and issues are about food safety. And, and it's been very easy for our team to drift off uh, on a food safety initiative rather than a people safety initiative. And that's the difference about this, this issue that we're dealing with is it's not a, I mean, there, there's a slight food safety risk, but it's, but it's mainly about how do we keep the employees safe uh, from each other. And so the shutdowns that we've experienced are more about the number of employees like uh, Mario mentioned uh, because by, by nature, by design, the things that we do on a daily basis and always have done protect the food stream um, and, and the things that we're cleaning really, we've increased some of the cleaning, but it's not drastically different. Um, so it's, it's more about keeping the employees, um, with, you know, that six, six feet apart and uh, maintaining that social distancing. Okay, thank you. Um, I hear you talking about um, regulations and following recommendations. Let's talk about OSHA inspections. Are those still required in the bakeries right now? Um, they've, uh, to my knowledge, they, they've put a halt on, on in-plant visits. We've had a call uh, from one, but uh, they've, they've halted those uh, in our area. Yeah, very similar to, to, to our locations. I, you know, the same, um, they'll do exterior inspections, but anything interior to your facility that has been halted, uh, those are not going on. Um, so uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's one of the things that we found. It, it still does, we still do not relax on our safety. We have safety specialists throughout our facilities. That is their main function. Um, so we've, uh, you know, we, we've certainly uh, maintained that, uh, that level of caution. Yeah, and have you noticed any changes or been made aware of any changes regarding what's considered a recordable incident? Um, we, we've discussed that quite a bit, and there's been uh, some guidance, uh, uh, but it, it, I don't think it, in my, to my knowledge, it's not 100% defined, um, but, uh, but currently we're operating under the, uh, the, the situation of it not being recordable. The thing about, um, you know, recordable injuries 
is that um, if, if it's a, a strain or something physical, you know, the, the jobs that people do at work is the most strenuous part of their day. So it's really hard to, uh, you know, uh, separate that from a, a physical injury. Uh, but because this is such a widespread issue um, that uh, what we've been uh, told is that there's really no identifiable way to uh, pinpoint where a person could have been infected. Uh, so um, to my knowledge, it, well, today it's not considered a recordable uh, and, and, and I believe that's the way it'll stay, but we'll have to see. Yeah. And like Brandon, we're doing the same thing. Um, the way we interpreted it, it not a recordable, but the HR team is still keeping track of everybody that is out quarantined or has uh, selected to take FMLA. Um, and we're just trying to keep all that documentation together. One, it helps with tracking folks and scheduling because um, it's really hard to kind of keep up with who's here and who's not from a daily basis. So um, that's kind of how we're handling it here. Yeah, agree with everything said. <laughs> <laughs> Well, as you can imagine, uh, a lot of our suppliers are very interested in your thoughts on capital expenditures. So do you see uh, new capital projects being put on hold? And, and if so, what are the factors that are driving that decision? Yeah, one of the things that, uh, that we have found where we're at is uh, given the fact, you know, the demand on our, on our production lines, uh, we have pushed out a lot of our projects. So Although we've, uh, we were in the midst of uh, implementing them, they have uh, since been put on hold and uh, our equipment is sitting in our warehouses and or being held at our supplier's location. Uh, and, and like I said, uh, we're right now we're looking at a July, August timeframe. Hopefully it's all gonna see, you know, play to, to what happens out there in the, uh, in the industry. But uh, also um, it's opened up opportunities for us uh, for, hope for actually beginning additional projects that we had kind of put on the back burner. This, this small window has, has opened up some, uh, some resources that we can now start uh, looking at some of our other projects that we uh, had scheduled for a later time uh, for, for development. Uh, but we pulled those forward and are, are starting to, to, to move on those. Uh, given the fact that uh, we're right now should have been an implementation uh, at our facilities, uh, so so it's it's kind of been beneficial for our group. Yeah, at Roscam, uh, in regards to capital expenditures, the unknown is is what's holding us back. Uh, how long is it going to last? How long uh, do we need to do the things that we're doing? And uh, what's going to change in the future? What uh, uh, somebody mentioned uh, thermal imaging uh, cameras at at the door. We we have handheld. Uh, cameras, but the new future may be automated systems. And so should we hold back capital for that versus things that we would normally spend it on? So it, it, it's a holding pattern for us, uh, just, you know, trying to be mindful about where we spend our money because there's things that, like I said, we, we're learning things every day. And, and so it's uh, trying to be mindful about where, what, what our future projects are going to need to be. In our case, we didn't have any major uh, projects for this year. We're coming off of a few the last couple of years. Um, so it will remain to be seen whether, you know, coming out of the situation, there will be learnings or, or needs identified uh, that will require us to look at uh, some additional projects uh, in the near future. Okay. Richard, a quick follow-up. You mentioned the demand on your, um, your lines right now. Can you tell us about the demand over the last few months? Uh, are you talking to me, Emily? I'm sorry, you just broke up there for a minute. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, mean, yeah. Can you tell us about the demand over the last few months? Oh yes, yeah. The 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 needs for our uh, for our production lines to continue to operate. Uh, you know, we're we're producing at 120 percent of of our capacity. Um, shifts that we didn't normally have. We're you know we're a two shift operation. We've gone through a three shift operation. Um, our sanitation, uh, you know, windows have, we've, we've minimized those, um, but we are still cleaning, but we're cleaning with more people um, just so we can uh, shorten that, uh, that window and then get back into operation. So 
uh, yes, we are, uh, we're, we're running around the clock seven days a week. And for whatever reason, um, you know, these, these products, we can, we can barely keep them on the shelves. Um, our, our, our bakeries, uh, by the time you pull something out of the oven, let it cool, put, you can't even get it to the rack before somebody is snatching it up and, and taking it out. So, um, yeah, they're, they're still in the, in the mode of, uh, of they're going to be at home for a while. So they're going to ensure they've got food. So yeah, they're, they're, they, they haven't slowed down yet for us. Okay, thank you. Um, when you're talking about uh, the capital projects, what might drive justification for those when you do move forward? John, I think you had a couple of ideas about what might be your next capital project. Um, well, the thermal scanning is what we talked about. Um, actually, we're looking into it now. Um, that all employees that when they come in through the entrance and, and everybody here is going to come through and get scanned and um, the technology of how we can control um, a failure. If God forbid somebody does have an elevated temperature and then how that we stop them from getting into the facility. So that's what we're kind of working through right now. You know, that's, a, that's the same on us. We're, we're looking at the automated thermal scanning uh, because we do have employee entrances. Um, when you have four or 500 people in and out of facility every day, um, trying to do that on an individual basis is, is becoming quite the task. Um, so we're looking at automated systems that are out there right now and uh, implementing them and then putting the procedures together to get them out of the stream um, and get them turned around. Uh, so those uh, those are the things that uh, that my team's going to be focusing on. Uh, one of those you know opportunities that that happen to arise by the uh, by the lack of uh, or the you know the the hold on the project. So those are the things that we're going to be focusing on. Hey, Emily, um, in regards to what might drive justification, uh, one thing to keep in mind or that's a reality is all these things that we're doing are in addition to what we used to do in the past. Um, the, the increases in, in pay, the thermals, you know, all these things are, are uh, quite honestly driving our cost up. Um, so uh, if anything, I think uh, as our costs go up, that's going to um, allow automation to be more feasible and have a, a quicker payback. So it, it, it's, uh, I think that's kind of the reality of the situation is that as all these things change, we've got to find ways to offset cost. Well, to that point, as you're thinking about these capital projects, um, are you worried about the demand decreasing anytime soon? And is there a need to sort of preserve cash right now? I think there is a need to preserve cash for the things I mentioned earlier about we don't know what we don't know. Um, we may need to spend cash on things that we didn't know about. Um, but, uh, you know, there's uh, the, the main focus is on the day to day and it's and it's hard to think strategically uh, over the last month or so because we're learning things every day. So I think um, and, and working on those things, but the demand, uh, Roscam is very fortunate uh, that we have, we're, we have a very diverse business. Um, we have demand decreased in certain areas in, in the food service part of our business. I don't expect that that's gonna bounce back anytime soon. Um, but we're fortunate where uh, on the retail side of the business, it's, it's uh, I think uh, Richard knows better than any of us, it's make all you can make. Um, so I, I don't think demand's really the, the uh, in, our, in our business is, is holding us back. It's, it's the unknown of what we might need to spend it on. And, and that is, and you're absolutely right there, um, Brandon. Um, you know, some of the projects that, um, that we were looking at, we're now going to look at a little bit differently, uh, given the uh, the environment out there right now with the, with this with this uh, virus. Uh, so, you know, that we uh, we are going to probably just take a little bit of a step back, look at what potentially may be the new needs uh, for that project that we can go ahead and integrate into into the into the installation and the implementation. So. Um, 
So absolutely. And, and we're fortunate that we, you know, my team is very diverse. We're not only in the bakeries, we got dairies, we got fresh foods. Um, so we have uh, delis. Uh, so we have multiple, um, you know, avenues to be able to draw resources from that, that that's going to help us, um, you know, with, with some of these new, these new norms for us. Okay. Um, we're talking, seeing some trends in food change which was probably to be expected. Um, and during the panic buying wave, customers were much less picky about what they got and they were just buying whatever was available. Mm -hmm. um, what do you see happening in terms of product variety and trends over the next three months to a year? How are you handling that? Our, our supermarket business is, and those products are, we can't make enough. We, we, there's not enough time in the day right now. Um, we have had to do some skew rationalization right now. Um, not so many of the individual different flavors of this, that right now, just cutting into line time and, and trying to um, make sure that we have as much product on the shelf as we can. Um, I think that, you know, it's, it's, there's kind of a real unknown as to where, you know, how many restaurants come back and survive from this? How many, you know, you know, the ballparks will eventually open and concerts will begin again. Um, so that business, will, that food service side of the business will, will be there. It's just, when will it come back? So yeah, that's kind of how we're looking at it right now. I agree with John. We've seen uh, SQA, SQ, SKU rationalization, uh, and, uh, you know, for the, the supermarket products and, you know, for operations, you know, we wish we could only make one product, but that's not feasible. But um, I think it'll, I think it'll change, but it'll bounce back because I think in the end, uh, people want variety. Uh, but right now, I 100% agree with John. It's, it's just make as much as you can make. And in line with what everybody's saying, I mean, we do service both retail and food service customers. The majority, large majority for us is retail. Uh, but again, as, as we've seen some of that demand on the food service side come down, that's capacity that we've been able to allocate um, to the, uh, the retail service segment. And, and particularly with, you know, on the bond and roll side, it's been crazy. I mean, it's like it's 4th of July every week. Uh, it's, it's, you know, I, I think people are just giving their kids and families hamburgers or hot dogs every day for lunch because, uh, you know, we can't make enough hot dog buns and, and hamburger rolls and, and you know, it's, uh, it's, it's, again, it's, it's, it's the level of capacity and a production that we normally do for the long summer weekends, uh, but it's been now holding steady for, for four or five, maybe six weeks going. So, um, you know, it's, 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 it's been great, but it's been a lot of work. Yeah, in, in terms of food changing and the processing of that, do you see any retooling possibly happening so that more items can be individually wrapped versus bulk packing? You know, for, for our businesses, um, you know, when, whenever you are, because we, we like to do, produce a lot of fresh products, um, we're certainly reevaluating some of our packaging components. Um, some of them are breathable. Um, obviously, that poses a problem for, for an additional sterilization step or sanitation step. So uh, we are reevaluating re some of our, our packaging uh, products for that purpose uh, to allow us to also have it easier for the RBUs or for any instance that they feel that they need to do that sanitation step at the, uh, the, at the retail stores, that that package will allow them to do that. Um, a clamshell, not so much because it's it's breathable. It's not 100% sealed. So um, yeah, those those products will be reevaluated. Okay. Overall, people are cooking from home more than I would say they were in the past, um, and we're finding a shortage on basic ingredients like yeast. Um, with situations like that and trends like that, how do you um, how do you see things going forward with trends in food? Um, it, it's interesting because we've had a lot of discussion about that here, uh, particularly coming out of our experience with uh, the hurricane a few years back, when again, people were, were, were locked down, not voluntarily or just because there was no power, most businesses were closed. So for a good four or five months, um, 
a lot of people were just, again, kind of like now we're just eating, do, doing most of their meals at home, um, which was good for that period as far as sales. It was, there was a good surge in demand, uh, not as much as we see right now, but, but it was kind of kind of along those lines. Uh, once the market started opening up, though, uh, I think there was a lot of fatigue on the, on the people that they just wanted to get out there. We're, you know, tired of just having the same things at home. Um, so we saw then a large move to the restaurant business, and we actually saw the category decline uh, for that period uh, following those, those six, seven months after the hurricane. We saw the bread category decline more than, more than what was already trending before the storm. Um, and I think, again, it was that people were just, you know, sick of being locked down for such a long time. They just wanted to get out. They wanted to, uh, you know, treat themselves to a nice meal or whatever. Uh, and I think in this case, it'll be interesting. It's certainly a little bit different because now everybody has power and so everybody's actually cooking more at home. It's not like in a hurricane where you can't keep stuff refrigerated or frozen uh, and you're you know, just using gas to cook. Right now, you, know, you have all the comforts at home, everything's going on, uh, but it'll be interesting to see whether once the market does start opening up, uh, you know, will people feel that need to go out and be a QSR or be a fine dining or a casual dining establishment They'll just want to go out and do something different and, and you know, feel like, like life is somewhat getting back to normal. So, Okay. Uh, we are almost out of time, but one last very important question. Um, what can the suppliers do to help support you right now? I think primarily it's just realize the, uh, the pressure that we're under with the search and demand, particularly the retail segment. Um, that, you know, when we need something or when we have something go wrong in our lines, uh, we need that responsiveness to be quicker than usual. I mean, if, if we put pressure on our vendors before, uh, when it was business as usual right now, uh, the pressure is even more. So, um, you know, make sure that, that they have all their systems in place with all their personal working remotely or wherever they may be that, that, you know, the, the, the service aspect doesn't suffer because of what's going on. Because again, we need the service uh, now more than ever. Yeah, I agree with Mario. It's, uh, I guess, you know, the only advice I could give is just be available, be ready and, um, and uh, be responsive. And I know it's, it, that's a whole lot easier said than done, but um, you know, uh, downtime is, is, is always important, but it's, it's more critical now. Um, but, you know, just uh, be ready, be available and, and be forgiving because we, we may go overboard a little bit sometimes trying to get things back together. So. And to continue to be supportive. I mean, listen, we're dealing with a lot on a day-to-day -day basis. We may not be able to get back right away, but, you know, sending an email or leaving a message and, and <laughs> as you all know, when we need you, we will find you. <laughs> Yeah, well, we are out of time for this morning. I want to thank um, all four of you for uh, your time, your valuable, your valuable information and input. Um, and to all the attendees today, thank you for joining us. And uh, please do give us your feedback in the brief survey and keep an eye out for future town halls. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Stay safe. Thank you.